every day you're bombarded by advertisements. You're bombarded by people who tell you that, you know, you've got to eat five meals a day, um, that you, you get in the car, you've got to have your drink and your food, and you've got to eat on the motion. And uh, so every day, you, you know, your, your instinct of saying that, you know, I'm not hungry, but you still eat. And there's so much pressure for you to eat because people are, everything is being pushed on you, the advertisements, the snacks, the, 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 everything just points towards consumption, consumption, because we need to break out of it because otherwise we are going to suffer. See, we are addicted because we've been made addicted. And then, of course, the medical profession, but also government forces have not really helped us because they've told us dietary advice that was not entirely correct. So we were told it was all fats, 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 fats. But now we know it's not all about fats. We know that it's also about sugar and carbohydrates and processed foods and what that does to us and changes our physiology. So, and these foods are addictive. So we've moved to a calorie rich, addictive diet. And that's why addiction is such a huge part of everything I talk about to my patients and I got to get them out of the addiction so that they can make changes in their life. So it's not just about just eat this, eat this, eat this. No, I have to recognize that these people are addicted. And this addiction is a serious addiction. It's as serious as being addicted to morphine or, or any other drug. And it's that serious. And people look at me and my patients look at me and say, you mean to say I'm a, I'm a junkie? I said, yes, you're a junkie now. <laughs> you really are. And, and I see it every day. I see it every day in my clinic. This is my clinic and I run my practice. Every day I do surgery. This morning I did angioplasty, I did a stent. So I'm a day-to-day -day cardiologist. And when I speak to my patients in the clinic in the afternoons, it's addiction. You know, one day and they go, oh my God, uh, I was breaking out in a sweat and, and I felt my sugar was getting low. So I had to go and eat and I felt better. And I said, and did you take your sugar level? And they said, yeah, and it was 100. Well, then it's not hypoglycemia, it's pure addiction. It's pure addiction. So that's what's happening. We've moved away from eating real food to addictive substances. This is, these are not foods, by the way. These are substances. So should we be consuming substance or should we be consuming real food? That's the issue. We've moved away from real food to substances, chemicals, addiction. And the combinations of these foods is also a problem. So you see, fasting is also about what type of food you eat. Look at the combinations. It's high sugar and high fat. And of course, there's lots of salt in it too. That combination is not found in nature. So when that gets into our body, it causes these hormonal changes. And the biggest hormonal problem I found was insulin. And I want to tell you a little bit about how I actually got into this. Please. Because ultimately, I'm just a cardiologist, right? So why is, why is a cardiologist talking about dieting and sugar and weight and, and all these things? Well, you know, I've been doing angioplasty and stenting for over 35 years. So fortunately, you know, in London, I graduated as an MD at only to age of 23. Um, so I got into cardiology really early on. And I would do this amazing angioplasty. And the, some patients do great. Others keep coming back. And, and sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Could you just explain angioplasty for those that are not familiar with it or maybe not be in the world of you know, medicine, if you could just explain that. Absolutely. So they come to me with chest pain and I do an angiogram, which is putting the dye in the coronary arteries and I find a blockage. So this blockage is preventing the blood from flowing into the heart uh, muscle and supplying the muscle with the oxygen uh, that it requires. So these blockages cause chest pain. And of course, when the blockage is 100%, you get a heart attack. And there the muscle is completely deprived of oxygen and dies. So what I do is I, I specialized in putting a fine wire into the coronary artery, the artery in the heart. And then I would slide a little, it's like a spring into the artery and open up that artery and then leave the spring behind and then deflate the balloon, pull it out. And now the stent is left behind. So the stent is an angioplasty. Angioplasty means you're just basically fixing an artery or blockage. So that's what I'll do. And, 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 and Drew, the thing is that some patients did absolutely great and others would come back with new blockages six months later, a year later, two years later. And I'm, I just couldn't understand it. And I looked at my traditional risk factors, smoking, high blood pressure, of course, diabetes. And then the list starts going 
blank. And I said, there must be more things that are causing this. And then that got me really curious. And then what happened is that I would have patients having heart attacks or angina, and then I would look at the risk factors and they don't have any. And I said, no, can't be. How, why does this patient have hardening of the arteries? So then this was about 20 years ago. I did a study here in my office where I took uh, 100 patients in whom I did an angioplasty. And I said, how many of these people have diabetes? And I found that roughly a third of them had diabetes. But I did a glucose tolerance test on all of them in my office. It's a cheap test to run, so I did it. And I found that actually 80% of my patients had abnormal sugar metabolism. But yet only a third of them had a diagnosis of diabetes. So what happened to the other one third or just over one third is that they had an abnormality in their sugar metabolism. They didn't even know about it. And then I found that about 10% of them were actually diabetic and they didn't even know they had, they had diabetes. So there's, there's a condition called glucose intolerance. That means your sugar level is a little high, but not high enough to make a diagnosis of diabetes. So I found that at least half of my patients in whom I didn't have a diagnosis of diabetes actually had slightly elevated sugar levels. And then that got me thinking that, why is this happening? And right around that time, we were realizing that insulin levels are really high in these patients and that type 2 diabetes is a, is a case of hyperinsulinemia. So let me just explain that a little bit for the audience. So what happens is that in these patients, they develop high insulin levels, which keeps the sugar level down. So when you do the glucose test, it doesn't look too bad. And you look at the blood test called a hemoglobin A1C, which is a test to see what your blood sugar has been doing over the last uh, few weeks. Um, they also stay nice and low. So, But the problem is the insulin level is so high. And I found that on my patients that the insulin levels were so high for 10 years, 12 years before they become diabetic. So it's finally when the insulin just can't keep the sugar down, the sugar starts going up, you say, oh, now you have diabetes. But guess what? He's already had high insulin for by at least 10 to 12 years. And right then my curiosity really got there. I said, you know what? There's something going on here. And then as the more research came out and other researchers also came in, I realized that it's insulin resistance. And now almost routinely, almost every patient gets an insulin level. Now, the problem is we were not doing insulin levels before. No one was measuring it. Uh, it, it was, if you go to your family doctor and say, I want to measure my insulin levels, he says, no, you don't need it. You just need a glucose tolerance test. And you do a glucose tolerance test, and it tells you nothing. It tells you that your sugars are okay, and you get a pat on the back and say, go home. But in reality, behind the scenes, you got this really high insulin level. So I think that this is a time when we need to be educating our uh, medical profession also that we need to be looking at the insulin levels because I'm finding that when I find these high insulin levels and then I, I chase that and I bring it down through methodologies which we'll talk about in a second, now I'm making an impact on, on those patients who have heart disease and all of a sudden I started noticing the patients were getting better. When I, when I bring the insulin levels down and the way I brought it down, uh, th there's no magic pill to bring insulin levels down, as you know. Uh, there's no injection to bring your insulin level down. Um, so that, that's when I, I got interested in fasting because I realized, how am I going to bring this insulin level down? How? How am I going to? Okay, 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 we're going to change the diet. Don't eat sugary things. Don't eat carbs. Don't eat simple stuff. But then I... As I started peeling that onion, I realized that it's not just that. It's also processed foods. It's also certain combinations of foods. And then I realized that, oh, my God, we're eating too often as well. That's when I came and I said, you know what? Th th there has to be one thing that will help all of this, and that has to be fasting. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I looked at my insulin responses. It was fascinating that... If you don't eat all day long and then have only one meal, you're going to make less insulin for that one meal than had you eaten that same meal after having had two previous meals that day. So what that tells me is that your, your sensitivity to insulin changes on a day-to-day -day basis or hour-to-hour -hour basis. So even your own circadian cycle, as you know, uh, makes you insulin resistant at certain times of the day. You know, like when you're waking up in the morning, you're going to be a little bit more insulin resistant at that time, things like that. So 
as I read more and more, I, I got lost in this field. I said, oh, my God, this is some amazing stuff. And how come we didn't do anything about this? So that's how I got into fasting. So you can see it was a little roundabout way that I got into fasting. Yeah. It was a roundabout way, but really at each intersection, you're asking yourself, okay, what's deeper? Okay, what's deeper than this? Okay, what's deeper than this? And that's what brought you to a place of, wow, this one thing, this insulin, which plays so many different roles inside of the body, you know, one of them being, you know, keeping your blood sugar, you know, down is so central to all these conditions. You know, you mentioned one, which is people having their arteries clogged. What are some other conditions, symptoms, issues, challenges that people are going through? Because often sometimes people hear this and they're like, well, I don't have any history of diabetes in my family. Okay, I might be a little bit more overweight, but I'm not having a diagnosis of diabetes. I'm not sure if this is something that I should pay attention to. But talk about all of the things that this is connected to beyond just diabetes, beyond just you know somebody worrying about uh, their arteries being clogged. What else is uh, insulin and, and having too much of it in your body connected to? Yeah, so... This insulin doesn't just affect the uh, condition of your arteries in your in your heart, because ultimately, remember, when you when you're born, your your, your that bud comes out of your heart, and then all the arteries grow out. The arteries in your heart grow out, and then the arteries, your aorta, your carotid arteries, and then down to your kidney arteries, your leg arteries. So that, these are all blood vessels. And what we've done in medicine is we've we've compartmentalized everything. Uh, and then we break it up into different organs so we don't see that there's a universal connection. So whether if you have kidney disease, for example, well, what's wrong with your kidneys? Now, there are many different types of kidney disease, but the number one thing is still microvascular disease in your kidneys. So when you have high insulin levels, the tiny blood vessels in your kidneys are not going to work very well. They lose their ability to vasodilate. So insulin blocks nitric oxide production. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator, as you know. So when your nitric oxide is not there, you can't vasodilate. And the body is supposed to have this vasodilatory capacity. You're supposed to vasodilate and vasoconstrict. And you're, you're supposed to have that flexibility. But you immobilize all your tiny blood vessels and capillaries when your insulin levels are high. So in your kidneys, you're not going to get adequate kidney function. In the brain, you're not going to have adequate brain function. You're going to develop major arteries uh, will also clog up your carotids, your peripheral vascular disease. So... Insulin affects every organ because every organ has blood supply and you are as old as your blood supply. I mean, William Osler said that, right? You're as old as your arteries. So the manifestations of high insulin are widespread. So I'll give you an example. Uh, some of my older patients come in and say, you know, I'm getting a little demented. I'm getting very forgetful. And the spouse will say the same thing. And I will find hyperinsulinemia. And when I treat them and I change their diet, and I'm not, I'm just the cardiologist, but I tell them, look, you've got to do the following thing. The wife will come in and say, you know what? His memory is so much better now. He's functioning better. And we now know that when you do magnetic resonance imaging studies in the, in the brain and look at functional studies, that it's the vasodilation, vasoconstriction that occurs in your brain, in different parts of your brain. And you, you basically immobilize all that when your insulin levels are high. And insulin is a growth factor. That's something else that people need. So how does it cause hardening of the arteries? Well, the walls of your arteries have smooth muscles, okay? That's why they can vasoconstrict and vasodilate. And what insulin does is that it causes that smooth muscle proliferation. So it causes it to thicken. So the, the walls of the arteries become thicker as well. So it's a growth factor. It also causes left ventricular hypertrophy. Big word. Basically, the heart muscle, gets, all muscles get a little fat when you put the patient on insulin or you have high insulin levels. So it's a growth factor. Growth factors also affect cancer and cancerous cells in the body. So a growth factor is something you want when you need it. But when you have an inappropriately high insulin level, you don't want those growth, growth factors to be there. So take blood pressure. Now, Drew, I'm going to tell you something about blood pressure. Okay? I've been dealing with blood pressure since the day I graduated from school. And I was told that hypertension is essential. Well, uh, there's no such thing as essential hypertension. There's always a cause for hypertension. And the number one cause that I have found in the last 10, 15 years, it's a hyperinsulinemia. So I'll give you a typical example. Young guy like you comes to the office. He's got no other problems. My blood pressure is high. I bet you you got insulin resistance. 
and I measure his insulin levels, this guy high. Bring his insulin levels down. His blood so now he says, well, my doctor told me I have to be on blood pressure medications forever. I was one of those doctors. <laughs> that you have to be on blood pressure medicines forever. You can't come off this. You've you got hypertension. Um, and I have realized that that's absolutely not true. Um, if you find a patient who has essential hypertension, I now look for hyperinsulinemia. And invariably, I do find it. Bring it down through dietary changes and, and lifestyle changes, and the blood pressures go away. And I've done that to hundreds and hundreds of patients in my office. So insulin causes hypertension because I just told you it's vasoconstriction and it doesn't uh, allow your blood vessels to dilate appropriately, and that causes hypertension. So when you look at metabolic syndrome, part of it is hypertension. Uh, and this is how it works. It's all because of hyperinsulinemia. So it causes hypertension. It causes hardening of the arteries in all your organs, and then you're going to feel the symptoms of that organ, whether it's your brain, your kidney, or your heart, or, or even your peripheral vasculature, or even endothelial dysfunction causing erectile dysfunction. So I, I, as a cardiologist, I, I don't see those patients, but my urology friends and I have now got this rapport going that, hey, you see those patients with erectile dysfunction, they have endothelial dysfunction. If they have endothelial dysfunction, there's something going on. You should, you should be looking at the insulin levels. And uh, it's been very exciting because we've actually restored endothelial dysfunction in these types of patients by appropriate dietary interventions and uh, reducing the insulin. So you can see that it has ramifications beyond what we imagine because it just depends which organ is being affected by the dysfunction due to the hormonal imbalance of hyperinsulinemia. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. For North Americans uh, particularly, the weight loss thing is a huge impact. Like that, That's a huge health benefit right there from uh, fasting, so, but, but in terms of longevity, 